Well, good morning, everybody. Um, it's a pleasure to be able to uh, be here with you guys again. Um, I thought today we would uh, talk about something that many of us see, some of us can conquer, some of us can't conquer. And uh, basically it's conquering the big one. So here's what my lecture is gonna be. What is the big one? This is gonna be outlined for today. We'll talk a little about tympanic membrane anatomy, surgical goals, preoperative considerations, conquering techniques and we'll i really want you guys to focus on one thing what is the classic overlay versus a combination of overlay with maybe another technique and we'll talk about the classic overlay the condition where there's an absence of the malleus and there's an absence of a bony overhang because there are three variations to the classic overlay which uh, was really written by Sheehy in the 70s. We'll talk about complications, failures, post-operative care, and summary. So what is the big one? Well, yes, tsunamis and earthquakes are the big one, but when it comes to otology, this is considered the big one, where there's essentially a completely normal ossicular chain normal middle ear anatomy, but there's complete absence, and I use the word complete, complete absence of the tympanic membrane, but there is the annular ligament. There's no residual tympanic membrane, and that's a really key thing, because I'm gonna discuss that uh, during the lecture. So again, we have the annular ligament that is, is, is persistent. So what are our surgical goals? Well, our surgical goals here are to close a perforation that's over three months. Well, we know that there's no possible way that a total perforation with only an annular ligand is gonna close on its own. Where retrospectively, we can say we've seen small perforations, two, three millimeters, four millimeters that will close on their own under the appropriate conditions without any surgical intervention. The second goal is to create a middle ear space because the whole purpose of this surgery is to create the middle ear space, restore hearing, eradicate any middle ear disease by closing off the ear to the outside environment. And last of all, is allowing the patient once this is all completed, to have access to bathing or water sports. So this is just a little refresher, uh, tympanic membrane anatomy. So for those of you who need a little refresher, we're talking about a, a, a anatomic structure that's about eight millimeters by 10 millimeters. Not very big. It's a transparent membrane. It's supported by the umbo of the malleus and the annular ligament. And one of the interesting things is the growth of the tympanic membrane is centrifugal. In other words, it, it goes from the umbo outwards. And then last of all is the tympanic membrane has three layers. And this is really important. The three layers are made up of the outer layer which is an epidermal or squamous layer. It's what we see when we do otoscopy. The middle layer, lamina propria connective tissues, which are both radial and circular. And these are important because this is where tympanosclerotic um, plaque forms within the tympanic membrane. And just by doing a simple myringotomy, we can disrupt this layer and you'll see some kids with little white patches of, uh, temp of moringosclerosis, we'll call it, because it's only isolated to tympanic membrane in the eardrum. And then last of all, one of the more important aspects of the tympanic membrane is the mucosal layer. And, and we'll discuss that a little more as we go on. So there's three layers to the tympanic membrane. Surface anatomy, we're all familiar with it. 
somebody devised anterior superior posterior and then inferior posterior and anterior and of importance is are the two areas that we're familiar with which are the pars flaccida and pars tensa and one of the reasons the pars flaccida has more pathology in terms of cholesteatoma formation is that we don't have that fibrous middle layer in the pars flaccida so any negative pressure due to eustachian tube dysfunction will cause the um, tympanic membrane to retract medially, um, much more so than the pars tensa. Now we come to the real guts of this lecture. What are some of the preoperative considerations? Well, first of all is the audiometric. Irrespective of the patient, they're all gonna get an audiogram. Now, unless we have a canceling effect between the sound wave going to the ossicular chain and being counterbalanced by the round window, we should be able to get a true results from an audiogram. And anytime we have a conductive hearing loss more than, and the standard is about 25 decibels. And in this case, we've got a really, uh, we've got a 40 decibel hearing loss. It means two things. Yes, we have a perforation here, but we've, because we can see it on otoscopy, but what is the cause for the excessive hearing loss? And that is due to the fact that there's probably something going on with the ossicular chain. Maybe chronic fibrosis of the ligaments of the malleus head have caused it to decrease vibratory component. Perhaps there's erosion much more common in the ankylostapedial joint, which will see not only erosions, but um, complete absence of the ankylostapedial joint. So you have to take the conductive hearing loss component into consideration when you're doing this surgery. The other thing is the canal size. One of the goals of doing lateral tympanoplasty is to try to get one complete position by which you can see the whole annular ligament without moving the microscope. And enlarging the canal size is, is one of those factors that we will do or procedures we will do um, during the lateral graft and panoplasty. So the larger canal size, the easier it is, the easier it is for us to, um, to do the surgery. The size of the perforation, well, again, we're dealing in this case with you know, the big one, okay? Drum remnant. This is something I'm gonna really harp on. If you have any drum remnant and you don't have a lot of experience at doing lateral graft and panoplasty, you do have some options. And we'll discuss this in the next few slides. Annular ligament is critical. It's not only a supportive structure, but it also helps to revascularize the tympanic membrane. Through, its, through the blood supply. Middle ear mucosa. The healthier the middle ear mucosa, the greater the success rate of surgery. If you've got polypoid inflammatory tissue in the middle ear, yes, it's a result of a perforation and a chronic inflammatory reaction. And it should subside once the middle ear is closed from the external environment. But most importantly, if you're starting off with a clean, dry middle ear, your success rates will be higher. The other thing you have to assess, is there an anterior canal overhang? And what I mean by that is right here. Can you guys see the pointer? Nestor, can you see the pointer? Yes, Richard, okay. we can see it. Okay, so here's our anterior canal wall. And the most important thing is, is there a bulge here? Is there a bulge such that it's blocking our view of the anterior portion of the annulus? And if it is, we're gonna to have to drill it out. And I'll show you certain situations where we don't even have to remove the skin or drill out the anterior canal bony overhang because there is none, okay? Ossicular chain status, we've talked about that. We talked about that in the evaluation using the audiogram, but also in, using the microscope and manipulation of the malleus, we'll be able to see the ossicular chain mobility. We can look at the round window reflex if we want, but we'll be able to assess the um, ossicular chain. Malleus condition. Many of these chronic ears with total perforations who have had significant inflammatory conditions in the past 
you will see rotation of the malleus such that the umbo here is almost touching the promontory. And one of the goals of lateral tympanoplasty is that you have to get your graft underneath the malleus. So at times, one will have to use what's called a malleus nipper and amputate the distal end of the malleus to insert the graft underneath the malleus. Um, sometimes the malleus can also be significantly re reduced in its mobility. You, state in, you station two patency, um, it's a pretty moot point. We're gonna do the surgery irrespective, but if you've got an endoscope oh, and you can see it anteriorly, um, and look in the station tube, you can assess that. And last of all is the grafting material. Okay. Hey, can somebody shut your children off? Okay, thank you. So drum remnant is really critical here because it's gonna determine if we're gonna have to do the, the, the conventional Sheehy lateral tympanoplasty, which would be this scenario here, because in this scenario, anteriorly, all we have left is the annulus. In another option, we have not only the, the annulus, but we still have remnant of tympanic membrane with epidermal and fibrous layer medially. So in this case, there are options to do an underlay overlay combination or maybe just an underlay, maybe an anterior pocket, or maybe a cartilage support. So looking, one of the key factors that I'm gonna repeat here in this lecture is to look anteriorly, okay? Just for historical purposes, there's a couple of guys that are famous, Bellucci who makes our Bellucci scissor, who's the Bellucci scissors named after in Austin. And they both looked at different, aspects of the middle ear and, and, and use that to reference overall success of surgery. And Bellucci looked at the middle ear status. The lower the number, the better. So if you got a dry ear, you got a number one, you're gonna have a greater chance of success. If you go to debt number four, persistent drainage, okay, or a nasal pharyngeal malformation causing persistent drainage, you're gonna have a less successful chance of having surgery. There are some people who operate on patients who have chronic infections and persistent drainage. Um, my overall gut feeling is that I'll do a mastoidectomy for cholesteatoma or chronic mastoiditis, but I'm not gonna do a simple tympanoplasty in a, an infected ear. I'm gonna to try to get it to drain, I mean, to, to dry up. Austin looked at the ossicle, ossicle remnants and the more ossicles you have, obviously, malleus, zinc, and stapes compared to not having anything but the malleus and no stapes, the results get go from good to poor. And again, this is regarding the component of re a re reconstruction of the hearing. So what's our surgical approach? Our surgical approach for the big one, okay, is to go retroauricular. Why? Because the classic surgery requires opening in the ear canal, drilling it, and removing skin from the anterior ear canal. We go post auricular. You can see there's five different incisions here. We don't need to go super far post auricular to, in this type of surgery. We limit our incision to either one or two for the sole purpose of cosmesis and grafting material. The grafting material we are going to need is the temporalis fascia. You can see the green check mark there. Unfortunately, we can't use perichondrium because it's not big enough. And allografts, we do have sheets of allograft that would suffice to uh, cover the tympanic membrane. Unfortunately, they're, they're, they're expensive when you start getting sizes eight by 10 millimeters. And I don't have, I have experience using it for tympanic membrane repair and uh, total stapendectomy, but I be, would be reluctant to use it for a lateral graft tympanoplasty only because I would prefer using fascia from the patient. And it's just a personal opinion. As far as the, um, the tympanic membrane graft, 
the graft is going to be a circular disc, essentially the size of our, our large, our, our thumb uh, fingernail. And under the conditions where you have a malleus, you will make a single slit here so that as we put the graft in, we slip it underneath the malleus and we have an anterior and a posterior flap that will flip over to cover the exposed malleus and umbo. Under the conditions where we do not have a malleus, okay, again, this is for the more experienced surgeon, we need to make two cuts and we'll have an anterior portion, a central portion and a posterior portion. As you can see here, the central portion is now gone. That's because we've tucked it into the attic and we're laying it on the superior canal wall, but from the backside to give us support. If you do not have this support, okay, by the central flap, there is the possibility of lateralization of your flap, or excuse me, of your repaired tympanic membrane. And we'll talk a little about that. And then these two flaps will, flap, will flip over upon each other at the anterior superior canal. So what are the surgical repair techniques that we have? Let's watch this for just a second. See you again, cheese. Staff will do whatever they can. Thank you so much. You're welcome. To help make your life a little easier. Okay, so what's the purpose of this little Caltex commercial? First of all is he was trying to do good and we as surgeons are all trying to do good. We're trying to help our patients. But unfortunately, he had the wrong diagnosis and the wrong treatment. So you need to make the right diagnosis based upon whether or not there's any remnant of the drum still there that you can use is the ossicular chain intact and make sure you do the right surgery. So this is where I come to what's called the turning point. You can see on the left side here, we have drum remnant here. And this would what it would look like under otoscopy. We got maybe two millimeters of anterior drum remnant aside from the annulus. And in the experienced person's hands, this can be used to do a reconstruction without doing a lateral tympanoplasty. On the other hand, in the case that we started talking about at the beginning of this lecture, where we have only the annular ligament, as you can see here, in this visualized otoscopic view, the only thing you can do in this case would be a lateral graft. Now, in this case, again, this is anterior. We can put a, we can do an underlay if you feel comfortable with it by just putting gel foam in the middle ear. We can put cartilage in the middle ear to support the graft from retracting medially and, at, and, and allowing it to stabilize as it regrows into the remnant of the drum here. Or we can do what's called an anterior pocket and I'll show you in just a second. Whereas on this side, as I mentioned before, our only option is to follow chapter 10 of James Sheehy, where it says tympanoplasty, outer surface grafting technique. And if any of you have uh, otologic surgery was written by Daryl Brackman, I believe this chapter is in that book. If anybody needs it, please just go on the uh, WhatsApp and I'll send you the book. I have it in digital format. So this is the, this is the cartilage support here where we put a piece of cartilage and you can see the cartilage here. So the cartilage is closing that space between the medial wall of the middle ear and the residual tympanic membrane, which will allow us 
to slip our graft right on top of the cartilage and adhere to the inferior portion of the residual tympanic membrane. And one of the important things is, because this is a mucosal surface, I like to use a little rasp to kind of like freshen up the medial surface of the tympanic membrane because it will cause an inflammatory reaction and bring in the cellular structures needed for the, re for the repair of the, ear uh, the eardrum. On the other hand, in this case, we could do what's called an anterior pocket. Um, about five to six millimeters uh, lateral to the annulus, we can make a cut of about a centimeter in length and then dissect a pocket going medially. Now in this picture, okay, you'll see the graft is already being ready for placement. This is the pocket. This is where the incision was made. We now make a, we've made a pocket and we go along the anterior canal wall medially to the annulus and we lift the annulus up. And then what we'll do is we'll take a, an alligator and we'll pick up part of this graft and we'll pull it onto the anterior canal wall underneath the anterior canal wall skin. And what this will do, it will stabilize the graft. So the hardest place to get success is anterior, especially when we don't have much remnant. And if we do have enough remnant of a drum, we have uh, these options as I've mentioned here. But now we're gonna go, and we're just gonna talk about the, the, the big one, which is the classic overlay. And this is the Shahi technique, okay? For those of you who might not be oriented, this is Spina Henley. It makes this the right ear, okay? The right ear. All right, we're gonna use a drill. Probably this is about a four millimeter cutter taken down the Spina Henley. We're gonna, we drilled out a little more here along the posterior canal wall. Now I'm using a 15 blade. You can use whatever you wish. And I'm gonna make a 15 blade cut right at the junction laterally of the cartilage and the, the thin single layer of anterior canal skin. And using a round knife, I'm gonna take this skin all the way down to the annulus. And you can see here, this cut that I just made was just above the annulus. And I'm gonna strip this whole rim of skin off of the anterior canal wall. And there's my skin, I preserve that. Now this is a condition where we do have the bony opening. So being careful and reducing the size of the procedure. I'm gonna not only widen the whole canal, but I'm also going to expose the annulus in by removing as much of the bone as possible so I have a single view. Now here I am right on top of the annulus, and this is a really important move. I'm removing any fragment of residual epithelium that will prevent formation of a cholesteatoma pearl. Now I'm evaluating the ossicular chain, making sure I get all the remnants of any residual drum. Oh, let me just step back here a second here. Now this is really important. We've got a single view here. We don't have to move our microscope. And that's really key. We've drilled the whole canal and made it large. We took down the bony overhang here we can see the anterior annulus, okay? And we've taken our skin out, preserved it on either a wet four by four or just in some saline. We've assessed, we've assessed the ossicular chain. We have good normal middle ear mucosa. I don't see any inflammation anteriorly, which means that most likely the eustachian tube will be a functional eustachian tube. Uh, I check my malleus for mobility. If I have to amputate the umbo, I will. Um, obviously you don't want to amputate up here because you won't have anything to put the graft under. Okay. So it's really important. All right. So now I'm putting some gel foam. I've already prepared my graft. I'll fill the middle ear with gel foam. Some people don't put gel foam in the middle ear. 
Now here's my graft. You can see there was a cut right there. And I'm gonna put my graft in, kind of repositioning it. And I'm opening up right at the cut. And I'm gonna flip this graft and slide it underneath the malleus. Underneath the malleus, which is such a critical step. One thing I wanna mention here is that when I did drill, I tried to make a little shelf here so that my graft will lay on it, okay? Instead of being completely tubular, okay, I have a shelf so that the graft will sit on it and be more stabilized. So there's the posterior flap I put over, the anterior flap is coming over and you can see it covers the malleus. Now, using a sickle knife, I will reposition the graft so that it is laying directly on the annular ligament. And that's what I'll do. And as we do in the standard tympanoplasty, the excess goes along the posterior canal wall, all right? Sometimes you might have to put a little more gel foam if you wish. Um, it's all a surgeon's a choice. But this is sitting nice on the annular ligament here underneath the malleus. Here's my skin. You have to be sure you cannot put the squeamous at the side and put that on the bone. It will not heal, okay? And that can happen. So you gotta look at it under the microscope and be sure. I stretch out my skin and I'm gonna reposition it. Sometimes it gets a little shredded because it is single layer and thin, but if you work it good enough, you can get it all back into place. So the skin is back, the drum is on. I use a dry piece of, of gel foam. Critical area during the healing phase is anterior. And we'll talk about that in complications, but I do put a dry piece in and then it probably gets wet within minutes anyway and expands um, as a result of the, of the remaining gel foam with Cipro being put in the middle ear, or excuse me, in the ear canal. And then we'll just close it regularly. We'll take our, uh, our conchal flap, reposition it and close the postericular incision. So this is the classic, this is the classic case. Now, what do we do when we do not have a malleus? Well, that means that we need to stabilize our eardrum so that during the healing phase, we do not get lateralization. Lateralization is one of the complications. We'll go over it in a little while. But what I do is, if you recall, we have that, the, the graft, just like the prior surgery, but instead of having one cut, we have two cuts and we have that central portion, which is like a tongue. I do a small adicotomy here. And what you're gonna see, I've laid the graft in already. This is a 45 degree pick. And this 45 degree pick is pushing the C part or that tongue underneath the superior canal wall. And we're gonna identify it in the, in the little adicotomy in just a second, okay? So there it goes. This is my anterior flap and posterior flap, but I'm just sticking the, I'm sticking that tongue underneath the bone. Now we're gonna move the microscope a little. And we're gonna pick up the, and here's that tongue. And I'm laying it on the posterior, I'm laying it on this, this the, the posterior aspect of the superior canal wall. There's that tongue. From the, from the graft. And then I put gel foam in here and I'll close this in a standard way. My graft will sit on top, on top of the annular ligament. So with absence of the malleus, okay, you have to stabilize the graft so it doesn't lateralize. And you might have to put a porp in. Most likely you're gonna have a superstructure of the stapes so you can put a porp in um, with some cartilage on it prior to closing. And let's talk about this. This is when you have no anterior canal wall budge, bulge 
it's when you have a, a fairly sufficient or wide enough ear canal and you don't have to remove ear canal skin and you do not have to drill. So this case, again, is another, it's a right ear. We have a significant amount of bone here, which we're gonna, this is part of the tympanic bone we're gonna take down. So we're widening the ear canal posteriorly, but there's no need, as you can see, to drill anteriorly here. There's, there's no, there's, there's no bony overhang. So all we're doing now is just making an incision on the lateral aspect of the annulus, which is right here. We're gonna make an incision and we're gonna pull back or pull laterally two millimeters of skin. We're gonna preserve all of this and then we'll put our graft on that and just flip down the skin so that it sits right at the edge of the tympanic membrane fascial graft that were created and it will help for the reconstruction. So you can see here, I'm kind of like pulling laterally with my one millimeter round knife. I'm lifting up here some of the residual canal skin because I'll use that in reconstruction as well. Anything you can preserve, preserve. I just cut the tympanomieto flap, um, making a little open door. I'm pulling off and rotating anteriorly the skin from the superior canal wall. And we're gonna use this all for reconstruction. I'm checking the ossicular chain again as you always have to do. And I'm making an adequate space here. This is probably the hardest part right here, anterior to the malleus to create a space where you can get your graft. And if you recall, I make a little shelf here. And a little gel foam in there. And then here I'm putting my graft in. Again, just like in the regular classic case by Sheehy, the graft goes underneath the malleus. I'll have an anterior, an A and a P, anterior and posterior flaps. I'm spreading out the graft here along the posterior canal wall. I'll put it on top of the annulus and I'll flip my A and P flaps over the, each other, covering the malleus. I'll bring my residual skin that I preserved and use that to cover the ear canal and the graft. The more you can preserve, the greater the success rate of the graft taking. And here inferiorly, I'm repositioning the graft on top of the annular ligament and you're gonna re you're going to recall that I saved some inferior canal skin. And that's right here. And I'm going to flip it over and it will cover inferiorly, posteriorly, not only the, the graft. And then I'll put my gel foam in. So this is a good case because it saves you from having to take out Excuse me. It saves you from having to drill anteriorly. It saves you from having to remove the anterior canal wall skin. It's a modification of the Sheehy technique. So let's talk about complications. As with everything, anything we do in life has complications. What do you, what kind of complications do you have with lateral or overlay tympanoplasty? One is perforation, two is blunting, three lateralization, four cholesteatoma pearl, and number, number uh, five would be a prolapsed ear canal. So let's look at each of these individually. 
remember, we're taking a fascia graft from temporalis muscle and we're putting it over the large absent tympanic membrane by stabilizing it on the annulus. And what you can see postoperatively, if you do not have good enough support or the graft collapses medially, is that you'll have a perforation anteriorly. And as I stated, this is the most difficult area. In the earlier lecture, I showed you that we could put cartilage in the middle ear, or we could make a pocket along the anterior canal wall and pull our graft up underneath the annulus and lay it onto the anterior canal wall. Why? To stabilize it, prevent it from retracting, because we needed the graft to stay adherent to the residual mucosa. If we have it inferior underneath the, the uh, if we have residual mucosa and drum, if we don't, we need to have it stabilized on the annulus. So that's number one, perforation. Number two is blunting. Blunting is the formation of scar tissue from the, in the anterior portion of the anterior uh, superior portion of the ear canal, where you will get scarring from the malleus all the way to the anterior canal wall. And this fibrosis, okay, will reduce the vibratory effect of the tympanic membrane. It will cause hearing loss. It usually takes a few months to develop. And um, this is, it's, it's blunting. You'll see it on otoscopy. You'll see that the, the anterior portion of the drum just doesn't look normal. And if you do an audio, you'll get a conductive hearing loss. If it's significant enough to the patient, you can go remove this area and resurface the eardrum. Lateralization. Lateralization is when you do not get adequate stability of your graft. And what happens is if you cannot stabilize your graft by putting it underneath the malleus adequately, or in the case where there is no malleus along the posterior aspect of the superior canal wall, as I showed you with that procedure in the video of absent malleus, what happens is during the healing phase, the graft will migrate laterally. And as it migrates laterally, it comes off the fibrous layer. And what we do we develop is, I shouldn't have said fibrous layer, but what we develop is a fibrous layer. We develop a fibrous layer between the uh, eardrum and the remnant of the malleus. And this is called lateralization. Now what you'll do is in patients who have had significant otitis externa or in patients who have had failed tympanoplasties, sometimes you'll see this similar thing. It's the lateralization of the drum and blunting. The next thing is if you do not clean all the remnant of the epithelium off the annular ligament and you leave it there and you place your fascia over it, you can get cholesteatoma formation or or what's called a pearl, okay? You'll see them, uh, it's like a little cyst and that's, that's another complication. And then last of all is if you are drilling and you're over aggressive, especially if you're using a large burr and it's a cutting burr, you're gonna to drill too much. You'll expose the glenoid fossa. And what's gonna happen is when the patient opens their mouth, this you'll get bulging of the anterior canal wall. Okay, it can, if it's a big enough bulge, it can literally uh, occlude the ear canal. So you've gotta be very careful when you drill anteriorly to not expose glenoid fossa and have secondary prolapse of the condyle of the mandible into the ear canal. So what are the reasons for failures? Well, it's like any other surgical procedure. If you do not have, if you have poor exposure, you won't have good visualization 
and you won't get good graft placement. So exposure is critical. Post auricular, drill the ear canal wide enough, 360 degrees, if you need to, to get the exposure to see the whole annulus at one in one position. Second is poor surgical technique. And maybe you're just not a good surgeon and maybe you shouldn't approach lateral graft tympanoplasty because it's, you know, it, it is the most challenging of all tympanoplasties. So if you don't have a very, most ear surgeons are very anal to begin with. So most of them are gonna have fairly good surgical techniques and pay attention to the minuscule. The minuscule such that you're laying it adequately on the annular ligament, that there's no gaps, okay? Uh, next would be an, an inadequate graft. Maybe your graft is too small. Maybe it's not fitting underneath the malleus or even on the annular ligament adequate enough and you're gonna get failure. Uh, the other reason for failure is you underestimate the pathology. Maybe you do have a, uh, a eustachian tube that's closed. Maybe you do have fixation of the suspensory ligaments to the head of the malleus. And even though you repair the eardrum, the patient's still not hearing, okay? So let's say you have tympanosclerosis. You might have to take out the malleus and incus. You're left with the mobile stapes. You modify your technique, okay? You put that that special graft in, you do a small adicotomy and you put a porp on the top of the head of the, of the stapes with a little cartilage on it to prevent you know, extrusion and you've solved the problem. So never underestimate the pathology. And last of all is poor post-operative care. In other words, these patients take months to heal. It's not like a simple tympanoplasty. They will take three months to heal and you have to be on top of them and you have to see them repeatedly. And what is this post-operative care? I like to call it the three, six, nine, 12. The first three weeks, keep the ear dry. You really don't have to do much. Next couple of weeks, you're gonna start putting drops for three to six. You know, ciprotic, uh, with a little hydrocortisone, you know, three to five drops twice a day. At six weeks, okay, a month and a half, you need to start cleaning the ear canal out gently, carefully, and don't destroy any of your, your surgical work. Once you've cleaned out what you can safely of what the patient allows you as to the healing phase they're in, then you put them on drops again, and then you clean them out at 12 weeks, which is three months. By that time, you don't need drops anymore. They should be well stabilized. And then you can wait another six, six to eight weeks and get a hearing test on them. So that is the post-operative care. So in summary, we've got our simple medial graft underlay, uh, underlay tympanoplasty, which most all of us are already doing. Uh, it's pretty fast healing. It's not very invasive. Most of the success is over 90%. Overlay tympanoplasty, it even has higher take rates in the right hands than does underlay. I can tell you at the house ear clinic for some even small perforations, they will do an overlay, uh, an overlay graft. Maybe this has to do with their preferences, but it also might have to do with insurance billing. It is a more difficult technique. And as I said, the, the healing takes about three months and the complications of overlay, of blunting, lateralization, cholesterol formation, and potential injury to the uh, anterior canal wall with exposure of glenoid fossa are things you will not see most of the time in underlay tympanoplasty. So what you're gonna find out is that with, and this is a real key thing on the bottom, with experience, you're gonna find out that you're gonna use a combination of techniques, okay? Like a combination of underlay and overlay to repair the ear. And this is all, again, based upon what is left from the disease process in terms of remnant of eardrum and what is available for reconstruction such as 
accessory flaps from the from the canal skin, like I showed you. Um, and this will all determine, you know, what approach you're going to take in, in, you know, conquering the big one. So with that said, I will end my lecture. Um, there's, you know, there's a lot to talk about when it comes to lateral graft and panoplasty. Um, and I'm open to anybody who has any questions. Um, Glad to share that book if you need it. And uh, we can go from there. No questions today? Uh, yes, Richard. Okay. Hi, Gustavo. Hello. Gustavo's from Uruguay, Montevideo. Yes. Um, when I do um, <clears throat> overlating panoplasty in a total perforation, I, I resect the annulus anterior, the anterior annulus. Mm -hmm. Fibrous annulus because I I think if I I not sure if uh, epithelium is remanent over the annulus. Okay. Over the fibrous annulus. Okay. I resect all the annulus. Right. And I put over the sulcus. Okay. My my opinion. What is your opinion? My opinion, I probably wouldn't do that. I would use a higher power magnification. I'd use a, a one millimeter round knife. I would make sure that I've de-epithelialized the annular ligament. The annular ligament is there, is there for support. It's there also to help nourish the blood supply to the new graft. So, um, I would be, I don't, I, I presume you've had okay results, but one of the things is um, that you will get blunting. If you don't have the annulus to support it anteriorly, that means you're gonna have to support it by bringing it onto the anterior canal wall. And you're gonna do that, and then you're gonna put your skin on top of it. You now have a higher chance of getting a blunting anteriorly and getting a conductive hearing loss. So. I would be reluctant to, to, you know, there's an old saying in ear surgery, if you don't need to destroy it, don't, and what you can destroy, try to save it and use it for the reconstruction. So I wouldn't be too eager to do that, Gustavo. Um, Giovanni, are you there? Giovanni was here earlier. I thought that maybe you were this morning. Okay, Giovanni, would you like to contribute to this question? Uh, can you can you repeat the question, please? Yeah, I'll repeat it for Gustavo. Gust or Gustavo, go go ahead, please repeat it. Yes, yeah, thank you, thank you. No, you 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 repeat for me. Okay, Gustavo. Because I, I he will resect the annular ligament. He will take it out anteriorly because his he's preoccupied with the potential to form a cleistotoma or leave epithelium on it. Okay. Uh, yes, I understand. Okay. Uh, that's a good question, but it represents according to the surgical technique, uh, for example, uh, um, according to the Hugo Fish statement, please don't touch ever the anterior annulus. Don't touch the annulus because the price you pay is a failure or is a blunting. So the main problem to avoid the recid a, 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 a appeal of cholesteatoma, that means that some skin remain embedded on the annulus, is to take care in the preparation of the fibrous annulus, uh, disepithelizing the skin very carefully. That's the trick but don't remove never the annulus. You can remove the posterior part of the annulus because your fascia is uh, over the posterior wall of the sternoditory canal, but anteriorly, the fibrous annulus is the only support of the fascia. So don't touch the annulus. That's my suggestion. Oh, Gustavo, did that help you? Yes, but Hugo Fish, Put the graft underlay the anterior annulus. No, 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 no. over. You can you. To me, 
to me, you can, uh, you can with the experience, obviously, you can categorize uh, your technique according to the situation. Obviously, if you have a total perforation, uh, to perform a underlay myringoplasty is a challenge, for sure. So that's why it's uh, uh, much better uh, to take the option of an overlay technique because it is more natural because you put your fascia or different materials over a framework and the framework is the annulus. Do you agree, Richie? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That is is intuitive, is uh, easier to put something over something that is supporting by below. Uh, obviously, if you do a, an underlay in a total perforation, the risk is much higher to have a failure. Yes, thank you. Okay, any, uh, any other questions? Oscar? Richard. Yeah, Nestor, go ahead. What do you do if you go into the uh, temporal maxillary joint in the glenoid fossa? You stop immediately, okay? Mm -hmm. Because the problem is you've already exposed it, okay? And there's really little you can, there's, there's little you can do. You can, you know, you can put some cartilage over it. Cartilage. Remember, yes. one thing's going to happen. That as, as the joint opens, okay, you're going to push the capsule, okay? And unless you get enough fibrosis, unless you get enough fibrosis during the healing phase where you do not get prolapse from the capsule, um, you will get some, some in, impingement or uh, protrusion in the ear canal. If, it, if you've got a huge defect and if they have a huge amount of prolapse, then you're going to have to come back and do a, a bone graft. Um, anteriorly, you're going to have to make an incision external and slip a bone graft in, but, but that's uh, hopefully, hopefully it's not something you're going to have to do. Thank you, Richard. Uh -huh. Any other questions? Uh, thank you, Richard. We actually had uh, one one of our patients uh, that uh, you performed this uh, overlay technique. Uh, I saw him one month after the operation, and when uh, he opened the mouth, I saw this like uh, small bulging in the anterior part. But then I saw him. At about three months after the operation, it was gone. It was completely normal. Right. That, and, that, that, and he was complaining uh, at the time of one month that he's feeling some pain at the area of the TMJ sometimes uh, when he's eating hard food. And, and just one question. What is the role of the cartilage uh, material and the cartilage tympanoplasty uh, in, in case of total perforations, is there less chance of uh, lateralization uh, or blunting if you're using the cartilage, like the, the cartilage with, together with the perichondrium uh, to repair the, the large perforations? No, no, okay. You're talking about a different scenario here. In total perforation, where you have just the annulus, you're not using cartilage, okay? You're using graft. Okay. If you have a large perforation when, and you're not doing an overlay, I mean, it opens up a whole chapter here. Are we using a composite graft of perichondrium and cartilage? Are we using cartilage? Are we palisading cartilage? What is the reason for the cartilage? And you know, how do we place our temporalis fascia? So that's a whole nother lecture. Okay. That's a whole nother lecture. So I'm not going to get into that right now because as a, you know, we don't have enough time and, and maybe that would be a good lecture that you could give us, Oscar. So I'd ask you to prepare that for us and give it to us next week, okay? Okay. Because we don't have a lecture next week, but you just gave one. 
So I appreciate your question and your, your uh, kindness in giving the lecture next week. All right, any other questions? Hi, Richard. Yeah, hi, Nega. Nega is from yeah. Ethiopia. Yeah, after how many days do you allow the patient to fly after tympanoplasty? You know, Flight. I, I'd wait maybe just a couple of days, but you know, the airplanes are pressurized. There shouldn't be a problem. Um, keep the ear dry. You know, we let patients with stapy surgery where we open up the vestibule to, you know, fly, you know, a, a day or two after surgery. So there should be no reason whatsoever that a patient with lateral graft and panoplasty should have, you know, a prolonged downtime from flying. And, and what about Valsavo maneuver? Is it prohibited in patient after uh, this kind of tympanoplasty? Wait, wait, what was the first part of your question? The, the Valsavo maneuver when they close. You know, anybody who has ear surgery, you should, you know, you should tell them not to Valsalva. I Valsalva after my cochlear implant and I went true vertigo, man, for about 30 seconds. So I don't recommend, first of all is, you don't Valsalva. Valsalva is going to remove, Valsalva is going to put pressure in the middle ear. It could lift up the drum to a place where it's already trying to adhere to the mucosal layer or to the fibrous annulus, okay? And you don't want to disrupt your surgery. So absolutely no Valsalva for patients who have had ear surgery. Any other questions? I just want to say something, you know, um, COVID's really, really going hard right now in India. And a couple of weeks ago, we had a lecture from Nilia um, from India. And I talked to her last night, we've been watching the news and I just, you know, I want all of us to just send our, our regards to her, her because it's, it's really bad. And I want us all to congratulate her because she got married five days ago, okay. So, Neil, if you're still with us, stay, hang in there. Um, any other questions? Okay, well, listen, if there's no other questions, thank you everybody for joining us. Uh, update, Oscar's gonna talk next week. After that, we're gonna have educational experience in Guatemala, um, and then uh, we'll have some other lectures planned. But um, for now, thank you all for joining. I hope you enjoyed this and have a good evening or whatever you're doing. And we will post this on the YouTube channel. So thank you all. Have a good evening. Bye, Richie. Bye. Bye, everybody. Bye. Bye.